Invasion of Greece by Persians under Xerxes, Defense of Thermopylae, B.C. 480, by Herodotus, Part 2. When the Medes were roughly handled, they thereupon retired, and the Persians, whom the king called immortal, and whom Hydarnes commanded, taking their place, advanced to the attack, thinking that they indeed would easily settle the business. But when they engaged with the Grecians, they succeeded no better than the Medic troops, but just the same. As they fought in a narrow space and used shorter spears than the Greeks, they were unable to avail themselves of their numbers. The Lacedaemonians fought memorably in other respects, showing that they knew how to fight with the men who knew not, and whenever they turned their backs they retreated in close order. But the barbarians, seeing them retreat, followed with a shout and a clamor. Then, they being overtaken, wheeled round so as to front the barbarians, and having faced about, overthrew an inconceivable number of the Persians, and then some few of the Spartans themselves fell, so that when the Persians were unable to gain anything in their attempt on the pass by attacking in troops and in every possible manner, they retired. It is said that during these onsets of the battle, the king who witnessed them thrice sprang from his throne, being alarmed for his army. Thus they strove at that time. On the following day the barbarians fought with no better success, for considering that the Greeks were few in number and expecting that they were covered with wounds and would not be able to raise their heads against them any more, they renewed the contest. But the Greeks were marshaled in companies and according to their several nations, and each fought in turn, except only the Phocians. They were stationed at the mountain to guard the pathway. When, therefore, the Persians found nothing different from what they had seen on the preceding day, they retired. While the king was in doubt what course to take in the present state of affairs, Ephialtes, son of Eurydemus, Emalion, obtained an audience of him, expecting that he should receive a great reward from the king, and informed him of the path which leads over the mountain to Thermopylae, and by that means caused the destruction of those Greeks who were stationed there. But afterwards, fearing the Lacedaemonians, he fled to Thessaly, and when he fled, a price was set on his head by the Pylagori when the Amphictyons were assembled at Pylae. But some time after, he went down to Antiqua, and was killed by Athenides, the Trochenian. Another account is given that Onetes, son of Phanagoras, a Charistian, and Cordalis of Antiqua, were the persons who gave this information to the king and conducted the Persians round the mountains. But to me this is by no means credible. For in the first place, we may draw the inference from this circumstance that the Pelagori of the Grecians set a price on his head, not of Onetes and Corydalus, but of Ophiliates, the Trachinian, having surely ascertained the exact truth. And in the next place, we know that Ophiliates fled on that account. Onetes, indeed, though he was not a Malian, might be acquainted with this path if he had been conversant with the country. But it was Ephialtes who conducted them round the mountain by the path, and I charge him as the guilty person. Xerxes, since he was pleased with what the Ephialtes promised to perform, being exceedingly delighted, immediately dispatched Hydarnes and the troops that Hydarnes commanded, and he started from the camp about the hour of lamplighting. The native Malians discovered this pathway, and, having discovered it, conducted the Thessalians by it, against the Phocians at the time when the Phocians, having fortified the pass by a wall, were under shelter from attack. From that time it appeared to have been of no service to the Malians. This path is situated as follows. It begins from the river Esopus, which flows through the cleft. The same name is given both to the mountain and to the path, Enopia. And this Enopia extends along the ridge of the mountain and ends near Alpinus, 
which is the first city of the Locrians toward the Malians, and by the rock called Melampegus, and by the seats of the Circopes, and there the path is the narrowest. Along this path, thus situate, the Persians, having crossed the Aesopus, marched all night, having on their right the mountains of the Oetians, and on their left those of the Trochenians. Morning appeared, and they were on the summit of the mountain. At this part of the mountain, as I have already mentioned, a thousand heavy-armed Phocians kept guard, to defend their own country and to secure the pathway for the lower pass was guarded by those before mentioned, and the Phocians had voluntarily promised Leonidas to guard the path across the mountain. The Phocians discovered them after they had ascended, in the following manner. For the Persian ascended without being observed, as the whole mountain was covered with oaks. There was a perfect calm, and, as was likely, a considerable rustling taking place from the leaves strewn underfoot. The Phocians sprang up and put on their arms, and immediately the barbarians made their appearance. But when they saw men clad in armor, they were astonished, for expecting to find nothing to oppose them, they fell in with an army. Thereupon, Hydarnes, fearing lest the Phocians might be Lacedaemonians, asked Ephialtes of what nation the troops were, and being accurately informed, he drew up the Persians for battle. The Phocians, when they were hit by many and thick falling arrows, fled to the summit of the mountain, supposing that they had come expressly to attack them, and prepared to perish. Such was their determination. But the Persians, with the Phaeotes and Hydarnes, took no notice of the Phocians, but marched down the mountain with all speed. To those of the Greeks who were at Thermopylae, the augur, Megastheus, having inspected the sacrifices, first made known the death that would befall them in the morning. Certain deserters afterward came and brought intelligence of the circuit the Persians were taking. These brought the news while it was yet night. And thirdly, the scouts running down from the heights as soon as day dawned brought the same intelligence. Upon this the Greeks held a consultation, and their opinions were divided. Some would not hear of abandoning their post, and others opposed that view. After this, when the assembly broke up, some of them departed, and being dispersed, betook themselves to their several cities, but others of them prepared to remain there with Leonidas. It is said that Leonidas himself sent them away being anxious that they should not perish, but that he and the Spartans who were there could not honorably desert the post which they originally came to defend. For my own part, I am rather inclined to think that Leonidas, when he perceived that the allies were averse and unwilling to share the danger with him, bade them withdraw, but that he considered it dishonorable for himself to depart. On the other hand, by remaining there, great renown would be left for him, and the prosperity of Sparta would not be obliterated, for it had been announced to the Spartans by the Pythian when they consulted the oracle concerning this war as soon as it commenced, that either Lacedaemon must be overthrown by the barbarians or their king perish. The answer she gave in hexameter verses to this effect. To you, O inhabitants of spacious Lacedaemon, either your vast glorious city shall be destroyed by men, sprung from Perseus, or, if not so, the confines of Lacedaemon shall mourn a king deceased of the race of Hercules, for neither shall the strength of bulls nor of lions withstand him, with force opposed to force, for he has the strength of Jove, I say he shall not be restrained before he has certainly obtained one of these for his share. I think therefore that Leonidas, considering these things, and being desirous to acquire glory for the Spartans alone, sent away the allies, rather than that those who went away differed in opinion 
and went away in such an unbecoming manner. The following, in no small degree, strengthens my conviction on this point. For not only did he send away the others, but it is certain that Leonidas also sent away the augur, who followed the army, Megistius the Arcanian, who was said to have been originally descended from Melampus, the same who announced, from an inspection of the victims, what was about to befall them, in order that he might not perish with them. He, however, though dismissed, did not himself depart, but sent away his son, who served with him in the expedition, being his only child. The allies that were dismissed accordingly departed, and obeyed Leonidas, but only the Thespians and the Thebans remained with the Lacedaemonians. The Thebans indeed remained unwillingly and against their inclination, for Leonidas detained them, treating them as hostages. But the Thespians willingly, for they refused to go away and abandon Leonidas and those with him, but remained and died with them. Demophilus, son of Diodromus, commanded them. Xerxes, after he had poured out libations at sunrise, having waited a short time, began his attack about the time of full market, for he had been so instructed by Ephialtes, for the descent from the mountain is more direct and the distance much shorter than the circuit and descent. The barbarians, therefore, with Xerxes, advanced, and the Greeks with Leonidas, marching out as if for certain death, now advanced much farther than before into the wide part of the defile, for the fortification of the wall had protected them, and they on the preceding days, having taken up their position in the narrow part, fought there. But now engaging outside the narrows, great numbers of the barbarians fell, for the officers of the companies from behind, having scourges, flogged every man, constantly urging them forward. In consequence, many of them, falling into the sea, perished, and many more were trampled alive underfoot by one another, and no regard was paid to any that perished. For the Greeks, knowing that death awaited them at the hands of those who were going round the mountain, being desperate and regardless of their own lives, displayed the utmost possible valor against the barbarians. Already were most of their javelins broken, and they had begun to dispatch the Persians with their swords. In this part of the struggle fell Leonidas, fighting valiantly, and with him other eminent Spartans, whose names, seeing they were deserving men, I have ascertained. Indeed, I have ascertained the names of the whole three hundred. On the side of the Persians also, many other eminent men fell on this occasion, and among them two sons of Darius, Abercomes and Hyperanthes, born to Darius of Frataguna, daughter of Artanes, but Artanes was brother to King Darius, and son of Histastapes, son of Arsimes. He, when he gave his daughter to Darius, gave him also his property, and she was his only child. Accordingly, Two brothers of Xerxes fell at this spot, fighting for the body of Leonidas, and there was a violent struggle between the Persians and Lacedaemonians, until at last the Greeks rescued it by their valor and four times repulsed the enemy. Thus the contest continued until those with Ephialtes came up. When the Greeks heard that they were approaching, from this time the battle was altered, for they retreated to the narrow part of the way, and, passing beyond the wall, came and took up their position on the rising ground, all in a compact body, with the exception of the Thebans. The rising ground is at the entrance where the stone lion now stands, to the memory of Leonidas. On this spot, while they defended themselves with swords, such as had them still remaining, and with hands and teeth, the barbarians overwhelmed them with missiles, some of them attacking them in front, having thrown down the wall, and others surrounding and attacking them on every side. Though the Lacedaemonians and Thespians behaved in this manner, yet Dionysus, a Spartan, is said to have been the bravest man. 
They relate that he made the following remark before they engaged with the Medes. Having heard a Trachinian say that when the barbarians let fly their arrows, they would obscure the sun by the multitude of their shafts, so great was their number. But he, not at all alarmed at this, said, holding in contempt the number of the Medes, that their Trachinian friend told them everything to their advantage, since if the Medes obscure the sun, they would then have to fight in the shade and not in the sun. This and other sayings of the same kind, they relate that Dionysus, the Lacedaemonian, left as memorials. Next to him, two Lacedaemonian brothers, Alpheus and Marin, sons of Orisiphantus, are said to have distinguished themselves most, and of the Thespians, he obtained the greatest glory, whose name was Dithyrambus, son of Harmatides. In honor of the slain, who were buried on the spot where they fell, and of those who died before they who were dismissed by Leonidas went away, the following inscription has been engraved over them. Four thousand from Peloponnesus once fought on this spot with three hundred myriads. This inscription was made for all, and for the Spartans in particular. Stranger, Go tell the Lacedaemonians that we lie here obedient to their commands. This was for the Lacedaemonians, and for the prophet, the following. This is the monument of the illustrious Megasteus, whom once the Medes, having passed the river Spurtius, slew, a prophet who, at the time well knowing the impending fate, would not abandon the leaders of Sparta. The Amphictyons are the persons who honored them with these inscriptions and columns, with the exception of the inscription to the prophet, that of the prophet Megasteus, Simonides, son of Leoprepes, caused to be engraved from personal friendship.